So welcome everyone to this release of the collectively annotated bibliography on artistic practices in the expanded field of public art. I'm Patrick Amselem, the director of the Public Art Agency Sweden. I'm thrilled that the agency was able to commission the Visible Project to compile this truly rich bibliography, which I hope will be a resource that many will find useful in navigating the expanded field of public art. The Public Art Agency Sweden is a government agency that produces public art and has done so since 1937. And I think it's fair to say that the agency has always followed developments in society and adopted to changing conditions so that the art being produced reflects the present day. And that means, of course, that it's been important for the agency to look at contemporary art as more than an object. It's about experiences, social interactions and critical practices. And in a similar way, public space also consists of mental and social space beyond streets and squares, space that come about when we meet each other and exchange ideas. A little bit later tonight, we will hear from architect and researcher Sandy Hilal. The Public Art Agency Sweden commissioned Sandy Hilal a few years ago to produce a work, The Living Room, a work that is, I think, a wonderful example of the expanded field of public art that we focus on here today. So I'm handing over now to my colleague, Rebecca katz Tor, editor for in-depth materials and reflection here at the agency to introduce the commission and the context of the bibliography. Rebecca. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, so hi, and another very warm welcome also from me. I've been working with this commission for the past one and a half years. So I'm very happy that we can launch it today. So this publication and digital platform are the result of a long-standing engagement by the Public Art Agency Sweden as a governmental agency on issues of knowledge production in terms of collected and critical work in the expanding field of public art. So in a kind of post-pandemic time, we will also host a physical library consisting of the book presented in this bibliography at our offices in Stockholm. So between 2018 and 2020, the Public Art Agency was commissioned by the government to initiate and support a wider dissemination of public art. So since then, or during these three years, we have encouraged, commissioned, and funded academic research. We have organized conferences and seminars, collaborated with artistic and curatorial programs, and also published an overview of academic research, which is then mainly in the Nordic and Anglo-Saxon context. So during this time, we also saw a gap between the kind of strict academic research and the wider field of publications on matter relevant to the public art. So we wanted to address that from another angle with this commission. So in the spring of 2019, we invited Visible Project, Judith and Matteo, to edit an annotated bibliography. What that is, is a classic bibliography with brief explanations of the major themes of each book. So our aim with this was to broaden the scope and reach beyond Western academic publications into other realms and expressions relevant for the field of public art on a global scale. So the idea by this commission was really twofold. As stated, firstly as stated, we wanted to edit an overview and also make a research of knowledge in the extended field of public art. And secondly, we wanted to reconnect to previous activity of the public art in Sweden, namely the Informationscentrum, as it's called in Swedish, the Center of Information, which was a project that ran between 1976 and 1996. And that was a resource for the art produced, which uh, with an archive and a library open to the public. So really this kind of 70s project of an open space of knowledge, um, which was physically open for the public to attend. So the actual physical library resulting from this commission will in a similar manner facilitate both an academic and artistic research and as well as being a resource for both artists and curatorial commissions and collaborations. So with this we hope that that will fur uh, further develop strategies for the knowledge production within and beyond the, the agency. So for us this is an important project and a means for us to build and foster international networks and contribute to the knowledge around public art in the broader field. So we hope that this bibliography will be widely used by artists, researchers, students, and many others. 
And with that, just before I give the word to Judith and Matteo, who will introduce the bibliography and in more detail and also introduce our panel for tonight and the seminar. I just wish to thank our former director, Magdalena Mann, and our head of program, Annika Enqvist, together with whom this project was initiated. So I also want to thank the contributors to the bibliography and to the project. And of course, a very, very big thank you to Judith and Matteo for taking this project on and making it such an amazing project. And it's been such a fun and inspiring collaboration with you guys. So thank you. And with that, I hand over to you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Uh, thanks, Patrick. Uh, and thanks, uh, really, everybody for uh, joining uh, the work that we've been doing for, uh, uh, as Rebecca said, two years. And, uh, and later, we will thank them uh, one by one. Uh, maybe it's important now to introduce a little bit the, these uh, next two hours together and to also tell a bit more about uh, what, how we have been working on this, uh, on this research. So perhaps uh, we're gonna just uh, say what Visible is very briefly. Uh, it's a project that uh, Città dell'Arte Fondazione Pistoletto started uh, uh, 10 years ago with Fondazione Zegna and uh, curated by Judith and uh, me for, uh, from the beginning. And it was really this idea of uh, researching, supporting and uh, uh, sustaining, producing socially engaged artistic projects on a global scale. And we have been able to do so through an award, but also through many other programs that we have been uh, uh, developing together with the advisory boards uh, that, uh, of curators and artists that have worked with us for these last 10 years. And in the same way, we also, we also approach this, uh, this research and um, get into the concept of this, uh, of this book. Uh, I want to recall a first meeting with, meeting with Magdalena uh, more than two years ago, when I attended a, a conference, a beautiful conference, the public art, a public art agency organized on researching public art, and where uh, it came out how, no matter how beautifully uh, was that research, there was a lack of uh, some kind of, uh, let's say, connection to the field of the practitioners. So, so we started to talk about what could be done. And, uh, and that's how this, this first idea then moved into a conversation with Rebecca. And uh, what, was, what Visible really has been trying to do for these last 10 years is really also to, uh, to be in close contact with artists in understanding what are the contexts in which artists are operating and what are the urgencies and the, and the ways in which the methodologies, the, the practices that artists have been inventing to uh, respond to the, uh, let's say, to the, to the, to the most urgent interface in every day. Sometimes really by establishing organizations, by establishing completely new, uh, let's say, uh, projects that are long-term, that are engaged with communities and with different contexts. Um, conceptually speaking, also when we approached this book, <clears throat> we really thought that it was important to have uh, uh, a similar uh, approach in terms of like understanding uh, what, what, what are the, uh, and we see now maybe the book is starting to appear, which is great, uh, how, let's say, um, um, what, what were the contexts that these artists were dealing with, and specifically how, uh, let's say, since uh, 2007, 2008, with the financial crisis, how, let's say, the politics, the neoliberal politics, how uh, the, the weakening of the public sphere sometimes of the, of the uh, welfare state and so on really made artists sometimes uh, feel the urgency to really take on certain issues, certain problems with their project, with their practices. So we thought, why don't we focus this uh, bibliography uh, on really the time, the last 10 years? Acknowledging how also with the 2000, uh, there was a, an incredible, a dramatic shift in uh, also how artists uh, responded to new, uh, uh, to, to the new, con to this context we are talking about. So we really asked uh, uh, the curators that participated from the advisory boards that Judith will speak more about in a moment. We really asked them to really focus on the, how in the last 10 years, certain books were really focusing on some of the issues let's say uh, climate change, uh, indigenous rights, uh, uh, gentrification of urban centers uh, and so on, how uh, there were books that were like theoretical uh, 
uh, let's say, um, uh, thinking that was uh, feeding or there was uh, having a, a lot of similarities with what the artists were, were researching on, were, were working on. So starting from this uh, understanding, we really uh, started a, a collective annotated bibliography that Judith is gonna talk more about now. So hello, welcome to everybody. I'm really happy that uh, we are here all together to present this amazing publication. It was a wonderful work. I would say also a wonderful collaboration as Rebecca was pointing out. And I will tell now a little bit more about how did we conceive the publication. So the Anoted Bibliography is introduced by a conversation with three respondents, our two guests today, curator and educator Gabi Nokobo and philosopher and writer Emanuele Coccia and Andrea Phillips, which is not uh, present with us today, which is professor at the North Ambria University and director of the Baltic Center for Contemporary Art in Gateshead. We asked them to reflect on the meaning of creating a bibliography today, which informs and inspires artistic practices in the extended field of public art. So we started working on this research in 2019, and at that time, we didn't know how profoundly this pand the, the pandemic will affect our lives. So when we formulated the question to the three respondents, we reflected on how the experience of lockdowns and governmental restrictions at different latitudes were reinforcing and generating new structures of privilege with consequently different conceptions of public space. With these conversations, we try to put in question the Western construction of public domain as a given universal, universally accepted concept and rather su suggest its existence as a translocal network of dialogue and mutual support. This translocal network of dialogue we try to put in place, inviting also 10 curators and researchers from different backgrounds and contexts who are part of the Visible Advisory Boards Network. We asked them to share their research with us and compile a list of 10 publications each, noting the reasons why they suggested that these titles as the most relevant in widening the current discourse around art practices embedded in the public sphere. Each note is enriched by one or more quotes, hyperlinks to the publishing houses or reviews, which enable the reader to explore topics addressed in the suggested books in a more detail. Then we invited also 10 colleagues to join us to give shape to this quite incredible body of knowledge. And I would like to present them also very, very briefly. It's Miguel Lopez, former co-director and chief curator of Theoretica, a Central American and Caribbean contemporary art center in San Jose. Lupe Yi, founding director at the MA program on critical and curatorial studies of contemporary art at the National Tape University. Julia Morandea Aritza Balga, co-director of the Esquelita of the Esquelita at the Centro de Arte dos Mayo in Madrid, Narvan Kio Patomvat, founder and director of the Reading Room in Bangkok, the Raw Material Company, a transdisciplinary center for art, knowledge, and society in Dakar. It's run by Marie Helen Pereira, Dulce Abrams Altas, Fatima Sai, and Tabar Korkan Yaye. Sheila Sheikh, lecturer and convener of the MA in Postcolonial Culture and Global Policy at Goldsmiths University in London. Felin Tan, sociologist, activist, and architectural theorist based in Marden in Turkey, currently recipient of the Kate Herring Fellowship in Art and Activism. Minakshi Tirukode, writer, creator, and director of new media for the Bashvik Film Festival in New York. Joanna Varsa, curator in the fields of visual and performing arts, architecture, and head of Curator Lab at Konstfak in Stockholm. And to end with uh, Vivian Zierl, curator, researcher, critic, and founder of the nonprofit found foundation Frontier Imag Imaginaries, working between Amsterdam and Brisbane. The Annotated Bibliography is also uploaded as a new section on our website, linked to the topics through which to explore the many projects of our archive. Of our archive. And we hope, of course, that uh, this um, Annotated Bibliography could be uh, enriched in the next years through different partnerships with other institutions. Uh, to, to offer to the university and academies and independent pedagogical platforms a dialogical space of reflection on artistic practices in the expanded field of uh, public art. So maybe it's, uh, it's important also to say how for us this was really 
um, a way to reconnect with all the knowledge that Visible uh, has been tapping onto through this uh, curatorial advisory board, but also to change uh, certain, to admit to uh, face a certain bias and privileges through which also art history has been constructed so far. And if we are here also to contribute to a bibliography that can be used to write uh, the future uh, of art history of socially engaged art in a global context, we also need to uh, uh, change the methodology through which a bibliography is constructed. So that's why that's uh, why we we uh, relied so much on such precious contributions from uh, uh, curators uh, working uh, in a, a, a different corners of the world and also in their own practices to really try to adopt sometimes decolonial methodologies to really uh, create a, a transgenerational uh, and also a very inclusive methodology of work uh, with artists and curators. Uh, we also, during the pandemic, it's also true that we also imagined a little bit uh, as if uh, uh, these uh, different bookshelves that are occupying the houses of our curators could be ideally connected, you know, as a way of creating alliances. So not just to uh, share a new methodology, but also to create a new alliances between the redefinition of what could have, what meaning could have art in the public space. And in order to do that, as you said, we also have to put into question what is public space, what is public domain, and also get out of, a, of, a, of a one uh, only way of talking about it. It is, of course, it's, it's a Western one that we definitely all of us represent at this moment and with our history, but also with the will to, uh, to problematize this and to include uh, as many more views uh, as possible, which I'm sure this is also what public art public art agency has been uh, has been doing so let's see, let's see also these connections between uh, uh, the books that uh, you're going to be able to browse through the book and through the and through the uh, online platform as really a way of creating new bonds uh, between uh, also what is uh, sorry to abuse the word but really what is urgent today in terms of, of also uh, what artists are pointing out and, uh, and uh, together with artists, also theoreticians, thinkers, philosophers, writers that are uh, contributing with this uh, bibliography that is definitely not a only art bibliography, but is a bibliography that tap into anthropology, philosophy, sociology, politics, uh, many different fields, but always with in mind how these uh, topics are so vital in uh, um, uh, Latin artists also think outside of the given boxes of, of, of uh, where art in the public space can uh, can take place. I so, would just add also the, about the, 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 the idea to work in a collective way because this is a methodology that is reflecting we really the visible project. I think since 10 years with Matteo, we were really always uh, trying to involve people also through the curatorial advisory board. But for us, this was also a way not to have a, a, a one, uh, one, only one perspective in, in, in working in this field, but really have a reversal perspective and inviting people from very different contexts was for us uh, the, the most evident way also to, to, to open up to other perspectives and other readings also of these kind of practices in, in, in the public sphere. So the, the, the book was for us a very natural way to work in, in sharing with others this research. Exactly. And uh, in the same way also, you know, it's, uh, it's really also working on with artists and uh, about artists that are really rethinking also the role of art and the role of the artists in society not so much as something for the good for themselves or for their community, but really uh, for a greater good, for a common good, for, for something that can really affect uh, communities on, at a larger scale. So, uh, but now maybe it's time to introduce our uh, schedule for tonight so that uh, everybody knows what to expect. Uh, so we're gonna have, uh, uh, not only uh, we are so honored to have two of the contributors, as you did said, uh, Emanuele Koch and Gabin Cobo, but also uh, we're going to have three video contributions. So one was already uh, mentioned by Patrick in the introduction. Uh, so we invited uh, three artists from the Visible Network, but also, as Patrick reminded, artists that also work with public art agencies. So also to, pin, to point out how much we 
we share as institutions, even working in different European contexts. And uh, so one is going to be a video by Sandy Lal, another by Pedro Reyes and Elizabeth Povinelli. And we all asked them to pick one book from the annotated bibliography and to explain why and to give some context to that. Uh, but now the first contribution uh, uh, will be a contribution by Emanuele Coccia, that is Associate Professor at the Ecole des Autitudes en Sciences Sociales in Paris. And uh, he has published many books, but maybe one of the most known one, or at least the one that is part of the annotated bibliography, is uh, The Life uh, of Plants and Metaphysics of Mixture, that has been translated uh, in, I think, more than uh, 10 languages, if not more. Uh, and uh, it has become really part of an ongoing uh, uh, dialogue and debate in the art field, and not only, of course. So we are very honored to, to start our night with uh, a presentation by uh, Emanuele Coccia. Please, Emanuele. The floor is yours. So thank you, Matteo. Thank you, Judith. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Gabi. I'm very happy and very honored to be here and to discuss with you about museums, uh, bibliography, but also public space. Uh, I would like today just to give or to start the discussion just with uh, not so much, but just three ideas about how to rebuild or how to imagine uh, the public space of the future. First of all, I would say that uh, what I realized in those months of lockdown is the fact that uh, cities, at least in Europe, uh, are actually a sort of artwork, an open air artwork uh, within which we have the chance of moving, uh, breathing, meeting people, uh, having every kind of experience. Uh, and I, I would say that uh, I never realized uh, how important uh, it was the fact uh, that we never think about, that we are living within art. We are not just producing art, we are not just producing art uh, and uh, meeting art within museums. Actually, our cities are uh, huge open air uh, artworks and through cities uh, experience becomes a sort of uh, artistic experience, even uh, even if even if there is there is no label, even if, if even if there is uh, if even if you are not the author of this uh, of this uh, of the object you are meeting, so uh, um, uh, the public experience through cities used to be a sort of living performance that also animate used to animate and transform uh, the artworks, uh, and this is. Uh, I think the starting point uh, in order to uh, understand how to conceive, how to build or how to project the futures, uh, the future of uh, uh, public spaces. Uh, not, never forget, no more forget that uh, uh, to build a public space, to uh, invent a new public space uh, is an artistic act, uh, it's an artistic uh, project. So in a way we should, uh, we should perhaps uh, ask artists and, our, and not politicians to imagine how should we rebuild uh, 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 cities uh, uh, after coronavirus. So this, this is uh, the first idea, but it's like a sort of premise of uh, all what I, I, I will like to say today. Uh, uh, the second point is, uh, is the fact that uh, actually the lockdown was a very strange experience. So in a way, uh, it was the experience of the destruction of, of cities, as we know, as we knew for centuries. Uh, and we are, we were, and we are still, at least uh, in a, a lot of parts of the world, we are walled within houses, within homes, within apartments. Uh, and perhaps uh, uh, it was uh, the chance of uh, realizing how, um, uh, in a way, how, uh, uh, how can I say imperfect uh, our apartments are. So uh, I had the experience uh, each time, uh, I mean, uh, during these months that each time that I had the chance to go out uh, and then enter back in my homes, I have this strange experience of uh, uh, each time that I enter in my home uh, of traveling in time, because uh, in a way our homes, our apartments, our, our, uh, our houses uh, are built following a sort of uh, a scheme or way of living uh, which dates of the 19th century. We are all, I mean, they are built following the idea of the 
family of the very, very European uh, uh, mononuclear family, even if we are not living anymore following this uh, model. In a way, we are living each time in the in the in our apartments uh, uh, a very strange contradiction because uh, we are trying to adapt ourselves to this. Uh, way of life uh, of the 19th century, but at the same time, through uh, social uh, media, through exactly this kind of uh, uh, performance like uh, Zoom meetings or so on, we are also uh, in a way uh, opening this private and uh, intimate uh, space uh, to a very different, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, fieldscape, uh, to a very different uh, uh, um, uh, uh, landscape of feelings of people uh, and of kind of bonds. Uh, in a way, we should perhaps uh, consider um, Facebook, Instagram, Zoom meetings as a kind of anticipation of how we should build not just cities, but also uh, private homes or private space. Uh, why? Why do not start to conceive uh, homes or apartments based on uh, friendship and not on uh, uh, genealogical bonds and not on family? Why we not we are not try uh, trying to uh, produce institution, private institution or a common institution where people are living together. Uh, in friendship, exactly like we are doing through WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram. So, uh, and the point uh, I, I would like to raise is that uh, the COVID crisis was also the evidence of the crisis of this uh, domestic space, of this domestic landscape. And we have to rebuild not just public space, but also the domestic space. And we have uh, finally to free domestic space from the patriarchal model uh, which uh, dominates in a way, uh, even if we are all feminists in a way. So the form of space, the geometry of space, the fact that uh, in a way every apartment uh, is modeled on family, on genealogical uh, models is the sign of this, uh, 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 of the domination of uh, a patriarchal world. So we really have to imagine, I think, institutionally funded forms of uh, uh, friendship, of common, of people who are sharing their life because of friendship, just because of friendship. Anyway, we have to transform Facebook, if you like, uh, in a sort of uh, 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 real stone space. That, that was uh, the second uh, point. The third point uh, uh, is the fact that, uh, uh, and I'm just uh, coming back to the first point, uh, the, the last point, uh, and I can get back to the first point, is the, that I would say that uh, the model we have to follow or we have to uh, implement in, in, uh, in the imagination of the future uh, public space is uh, it could be uh, sound. It could uh, sound a little bit paradoxical, but it's the museum. First of all, because as uh, I think Gabi will uh, 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 speak about, a uh, uh, museum is in a way a space of care. I mean, a, a space of curating uh, is the first elementary act of caring, and caring not just people, caring objects, caring uh, languages, caring media, caring sensitivities. So in a way, we really have to transform um, um, uh, cities into open air museums, but also for a second reason, because uh, museums in the last, let's say, um, uh, uh, 50, 60 uh, uh, years became a space of uh, sort of uh, wild experimentation. In a way, uh, 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 starting from the point where, uh, where uh, uh, Museum for Contemporary Art uh, emerged, those spaces that there were that were in a way uh, um, uh, um, uh, spaces where a community used to uh, protect, collect, and transform into a, a sort of uh, 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 um, uh, 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 so property, the past uh, became a space where a society 
try to imagine its own future and to divine its own future. So every time that we are going to a, a exhibition on, of contemporary art, we are not just going there in order, not just in order to meet works of art, not just in order to better know the work of uh, art, uh, an artist or another artist, we are also going there in order to understand what will, it, will happen uh, the day after tomorrow. So it's a kind of uh, exercise of public and common divination of the future. Uh, because within museums, uh, artists and communities are trying to uh, produce uh, an unconscious future or a not projected an, uh, 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 form of future. And in a way, we really should to imagine not just museums, but the city the public space and also perhaps the domestic space under this form. We really have to try to transform uh, every space where people gather, so in, way, uh, in a way, into a space where people are trying to imagine another way of life. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Emanuele. And uh, because we have a few more minutes that uh, are allocated to your presentation, uh, I would also like to, uh, before we get also to the part where people are going to ask questions later on in the debate, for which I remind everybody that you can write your questions on Facebook and on uh, YouTube, that as uh, Emanuele reminded, uh, are our, like also <laughs> our domestic spaces these days. But also maybe I take the chance to uh, read a, a little passage from the, the, the interview uh, that we had uh, in the book where you talk about a specific uh, topic that we were very interested also in bringing to the conversation and then we continue with the program and if you can just comment on this it would be super nice. So you say the new public space is already transnational and translocal. There is a public and you say that uh, the idea of plates will have to be abandoned in favor of migration. And you, and you also continue by saying there is public domain only through and in the middle of immigration. There is a shared space only when two or more spaces, two or more places can communicate. And what we call migration is only the bridge that allows one to humanly connect two realities geographically distant from each other. We should rewrite the political geography of the planet in this way. Consider that the territory becomes political, it becomes public space, only when it has been joined to other territories through migrations that have led the inhabitants of one to inhabit the other and vice versa. So I find this uh, really, really important also in terms of redefining what is public space today, you know? And you started with this beautiful image of also how the pandemic offered another idea of, uh, of uh, artwork experience in the, in the, in the city. Can you comment just on, on, on this passage? Yeah, of course. Uh, thank you so much. Now, uh, I would say that, first of all, uh, uh, the pandemic itself uh, showed us that, uh, in a way, they, uh, the pandemic walled ourselves into the domestic space, but then there was another public space that opened in front of us. This is this uh, kind of Zoom uh, uh, of Facebook, Instagram uh, space. And this, what is interesting in this space is that uh, it is evident that the public space, it is not linked to a uh, geographical space. Uh, and, it, it, and it became evident that for, uh, actually the way we used to conceive uh, uh, public and national space, it's a form of astrology. So in a way, in the past, we used to uh, determine has, uh, 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 or the identity of each of us, uh, 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 comparing the position of your body to the position of some stars in, 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 uh, within the sky. Uh, that was That is the idea of the ba Babylonian astrology. So I'm twins because of that and so on. But also the national identity, the political identity is a form of astrology because first of all, we know that the earth is a, is a sort of celestial body. And we are in a way exactly like in the Babylonian uh, uh, astrology, we are uh, identifying a body, uh, just uh, comparing its position in comparison to the position of, uh, of the earth. So, the, so it, and uh, we now can understand how stupid it is. I mean, this way of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of considering uh, the constitution of the political identity, because of course, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Political identity means uh, 
how can I interact with other people? And of course, uh, the interaction with other people uh, presupposes uh, actually meeting that is uh, entering in a relationship that didn't ex exist uh, before I came into this uh, relationship. So uh, that's why we have to redefine migration. Migration is not a, pertub a sort of perturbation of identity. It's uh, the condition of possibility of producing an identity. So migration, it's the condition of possibility of someone uh, uh, for someone to meet other people and to, in a way, enter in a political space. And that's why we have to, in a way, uh, uh, redefine a, a political identity starting from migration. It's the fact that you migrated that gave you the possibility of entering into a community, first of all. And secondly, uh, Migration is not just the, uh, what 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 was stupid, and perhaps the the uh, the, the word is also a little bit uh, rude because migration is not just the displacement of uh, uh, the change of place of one person uh, 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 in, uh, that uh, moves from one place to another. Migration is always a meeting of different space and different uh, cultures, so, and it's a sort of attempt to merge two different worlds. And that's why also, in a way, migration is a sort of, uh, um, how can I say, sort of a second, uh, second order political act, because you are just producing a new community, uh, uh, because you are just trying to merge two different political paths or two different political experience into a new one. So from this point of view, we really have to redefine everything, the political landscape, uh, starting from the very fact of migration or starting from the very fact of new meetings. Because uh, in a way, uh, since, uh, for instance, uh, Facebook uh, has no geographical space, we are just speaking about meeting. Uh, but meet it, meeting is uh, actually possible just because of uh, previous migration, a previous uh, move in a way. So that, that, that is what I want to say. So. No, that's super precious, and I think it's going to be extremely valuable in the conversation uh, afterwards. And uh, I repeat, if uh, you have questions also for Emanuele, please write them uh, on Facebook and on YouTube so we can also uh, take back these uh, very precious observations from Emanuele for the conversation afterwards. And now I think also we have a contribution that is extremely um, in line with what also you are talking about and also what, what you're doing with your work. And it's also, we will have a, a small contribution, a video one by Elizabeth Povinelli that is not only um, a member of the Carabin Film Collective that, were, that was a recipient of the Visible Award with their beautiful uh, improvisational realism of their movies, but is also Franz Boas, professor of anthropology and gender study, uh, studies at the Columbia University, among many other things. So now we'll ask uh, uh, Carolina to, to play this video where she really starting picking one of the books. So she's really able to talk about the separation between geology and biology and as a starting point of all the uh, colonial problems uh, that we are facing and talking about uh, right now. So please, Carolina. Wait, let me get this right. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, you catch me in Australia. Uh, I'm here with my Karabing family and colleagues, uh, and I am delighted to be a part of these short talks on such a, an amazing and wide-ranging group of scholars and thinkers and artists and activists. But I thought for this these short talks, I would focus on the amazing work of Catherine Yusof, and in particular, her A Billion Black Anthropocenes or None. And the crucial role it's played in deepening and expanding my own concept of John Topower. Black Anthropocenes explores the way in which um, the foundation of geology as a modern science was foundational to extractive economies of capitalism and the extractive economies of life. 
uh, in slavery and uh, colonialism. Geology as a modern science came to be separated from the epistemologies of life or biology. So, so Catherine really goes into the, the formation of this idea of geology as a separate epistemology, a separate science, a separate methodology um, than the biological sciences and how that relate understandings of the hierarchy of life and the temporality of life as it was previously understood. So on the one hand, what we see, what Catherine shows is that at the very root of geology is, is an energy politics and is a life politics. Geology was ex extruded or perhaps abjected um, out of life in order to fuel a certain kind of life or a certain kind of social project. So that's that's the first point that's has been crucially important. The second point, which is is equally more important, is the way in which the separation of geology and biology as as two contrastive uh, forms of existence. The way in which that what I might call a division um, or a separation of geos and bios. The, the last point I, I think is really crucially important to, to Catherine's work um, and why all of everyone should go out and read it is the collapse of this, this division or the separation between geology and biology and the, the, the the revelation i guess for the west because for m most other people this was not a revelation because they didn't organize existence based on this division but for the west the f the the way in which they have been forced to understand that that division between geos and bios that allow for the hierarchy between forms of human life in the more than human world has now collapse and been shown not to be a truth about existence, but rather a toxic governance of existence. See you guys. You did, uh, I think now you can introduce uh, Gabi. Yes. I would like now to, it's a big pleasure to introduce Gabi, uh, and I think she it will be quite interesting also following up um, Emanuele's presentation because I think she will focus more on the, on the mu museum as a public space of care. So Gabi is an independent curator, educator, and founding member of the collaborative platforms NGO, Nothing Gets Organized, which is active since 2060, and Center for Historical Reenactments, which was active from 2010 to 2014 in Johannesburg. Her curatorial practice, practice deals with notions of decolonization, focusing on processes of self-organization that take place outside of predefined structures, definitions, and contexts, and explores the impact of historical legacies within contemporary art. In 2016, Gabi co-curated the Biennale of Sao Paulo, and two years later, she was curator of the 10th Berlin Biennale of Contemporary Art. And we were very lucky because we, 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 were, we collaborated with Gabi since the beginning of the Visible Projects, because she was author of the first book of, the, of Visible Where Art Leaves Its Field and Becomes vis Visible as Part of Something Else, published in 2011. And she was also a member of the 2011 Advisory Board and 2019 Selection Committee. So, it's a, a long-term collaboration and always a very inspiring dialogue uh, with her, how also to reinvent uh, our, our traject uh, research trajectories. So I'm, play I'm pleased to give now the floor to Gabi introducing her speech with a quote from her inspiring contribution entitled Museum as a Public Space of Care, in which she's, she's questioning what constitutes the public domain today under the lockdown in Johannesburg. And here the passage I would like to quote, 
Our work has always been in conversation with the local alongside and in collaboration with international spaces that think alike. It is important to resist what the pandemic is seemingly inspiring, region, regionalisms, regionalisms that will force us back into engaging from a conceptual vacuum, lacking in re reflectivity, solidarity, and cross-continental dialogues that are more urgent now than ever before. So please, Gabi, our Zoom platform is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Judith, uh, for the introduction. And thank you to everyone who um, has worked on, on this book, on this project, all the contributors. Um, I'm very pleased to be, um, to be part of uh, um, such a, a project. And um, um, yeah, when I, when I received um, the invitation and also received the the questions, the, the interviews. Um, I remember saying to both Judith and Matteo that it, how difficult it, it was for me to, to answer um, questions that are specific, specifically that are relating or reflecting on the, on the impact of the pandemic and, and the lockdown um, as well. Um, so it is this project that kind of forced me to um, or gave me the opportunity to, to stutter, uh, so to say, or, or to tremble with, with, with the world. Uh, Eduardo Glissant says we understand the world better when we tremble with it. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for allowing uh, me to, to tremble with the world uh, with this, with this uh, project. Um, my, in my contribution for, for the book, uh, I reflect on the effects of the lockdown regulations from a South, Af South African perspective. Um, I do have a, a presentation that I would like to, to share. Um, or maybe someone will share it for me. So I, I start with this uh, slide, which is, uh, was a, um, a workshop um, which was titled Questions for an Exhibition, which was uh, um, a workshop led by uh, the artist Emma Oluka Wanamba, um, um, which took place in March, on the 12th of March in 2020, um, just uh, before uh, our national lockdown kicked in. Um, so it was like the last time we were in the space of the exhibition that uh, I, I, I curated uh, working with uh, three researchers. Um, and, and throughout the lockdown, I, I actually was also thinking a lot about exhibitions that were also in lockdown together uh, with all of us. Um, wondering also how exhibitions when we see them again, especially those that were, were, were closed during the, the, the pandemic, the, the, the lockdowns, um, how this exhibition can perhaps re-articulate what has been magnified by the pandemic uh, itself. So um, kind of imagining uh, kind of new, new articulations, new, um, new ways of uh, imagining things inspired by, by the works uh, um, and, uh, and imagining that these, these works and these exhibitions um, have uh, uh, perhaps a, a different uh, message uh, to us as humanity when we see them again, um, or, or, or they, they kind of re-articulate what we were trying to, to say in, in, in the first place. So for me, um, this, uh, this uh, this re-articulation, when I, when I saw this exhibition, which is titled All in a Day's Eye, um, again, it, it kind of also reinforced some of the things that I was trying to, to show with the, with the, the works from um, a collection that was previously 
private and now it is uh, the one that has founded a new art center which is located in, in, in the city of Pretoria, um, which is called the Javed Art Center, which opened last year, uh, 2019 in September. So it is a new uh, art space. Um, and so in, and in South Africa, similar to, to many places with, with histories of racial oppression, the situation um, of the lockdown cast a magnifying glass into our, our post-apartheid political economy, uh, re revealing the bleak face of a country that is amongst the most unequal in the world. And as much as these inequalities should rightly be attributed to centuries of violent colonial occupations, which later led to the vicious apartheid regime from 1948 to 1994, they've also shown us what most agree has been a very slow paced implementation of change. The fact has ensured that lived, um, our lived realities um, or of the majority of South African citizens remain suspended in similar conditions that in many instances have uh, been made worse by uh, economic conditions that remain in favor of uh, white monopoly capital. So to a large extent, the exhibition All in a Day's Eye um, is a curatorial undertaking that illuminates how for more than a century, these conditions have been systematically set up and continue to be upheld and felt also by a majority of black South African um, population. The curatorial and research undertaking uh, of making um, these artworks, which are mostly paintings from a, a particular era, uh, so modernist works of art. Um, so the, the undertaking to make them go public in this particular moment, it did demand that the project is also approached um, or grounded um, within a contemporary context. Um, so it's a, in, in a way, a way of writing ghost stories as uh, Avril Gordon would say, in order to address exclusions and invisibilities. Um, to write ghost stories according to, to, to Avril Gordon implies that ghosts are real. That is to say that they produce, they produce material effects between what we can see and what is in the shadows. Um, so in a way, yeah, the exhibition demonstrates ways in which these ghosts of the past continue to haunt our present. Um, and what we present with the exhibition was really a critical um, break, one that attempts to interrupt, interrupt the historical route which these works have been previously circulating. Um, something that Stuart Hall considers uh, as a term in which the terms of the par paradigm uh, are not destroyed. Instead, uh, the deflection shifts the paradigm into, in, in a direction um, which is different from that, uh, which one might have presupposed from the previous moment. Um, so what, what, I, what I share here is only one kind of segment of, of, of the exhibition. It's a, it's a works that are arranged in a kind of L-shaped wall um, for which there is an inside and an, and an outside. And what I did with the exhibition is to show kind of like the people who, 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 are, who are inside, who are, um, you know, somehow living in, in, in comfortable uh, conditions that have been made possible by uh, historical legacies. Um, and and, the, and, the, in, and in, this, uh, in, in this image, you see works uh, where people are kind of, um, have painted houses or their houses or the interior or the courtyard uh, of their houses. And then on the outside of, uh, of, 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 of that kind of, section of, uh, of a building or a house, if you, if you may call it, outside of that, the people who are kind of uh, outside of it. In, in my text, I, I, I do speak, uh, um, I do write about 
about this these ideas of inside and outside what is what is public and what is uh, uh, private uh, in the context of South Africa where people a lot of people also live in a very uh, cramped kind of conditions where it's not clear where the public and where the, the private starts um, um, which is a so you see a work uh, uh, by Vusi Kumalo of a, of a squatter camp um, so um, I was also interested in how um, perhaps the internet itself becomes is is a question of power, uh, so to say, um, because uh, when you go online and you Google uh, uh, um, South Africa informal settlements or uh, shacks, um, the first images that you you see on Google. Uh, images of, of people in, in 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 environments like this, but of white people, uh, which is quite like a, a distortion of uh, um, of 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 the truth in in a way. Um, and um, so, on the outside of that, of course, there's a there, there's a um, um, a painting by Gerald Sakoto of Yellow Houses. District 6, District 6 is a, a very historical neighborhood in Cape Town that was uh, uh, destroyed by the apartheid government. The people were, were removed to make uh, um, room for, for, um, for, for houses uh, dedicated to white people and where people were kind of moved into, into what we call townships uh, here in, in South Africa. Um, and uh, and and uh, and for example, in this uh, in this painting, um, uh, where um, also Emma during her workshop was kind of questioning its title that it's titled the figure in the garden, uh, and the idea that you have to really look for this figure in the garden in order to see to 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 locate it. It is a it is a it is a painting of a, of a mansion. Um, figures in the garden are often um, uh, black laborers who work in, 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 in gardens uh, as well. So they are kind of like issues relating to, to, to labor. All of these issues are still very much present, which is why this is a, um, a, an exhibition that looks at, at, at these historical works in, in, like in a, in, a present, um, in a present way. And then there's a, uh, um, yeah, this, uh, you, you saw that the idea of waiting also became uh, very much illuminated. People have been waiting for housing for, uh, for a long time. Um, so these are the, 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 the things that were kind of illuminated. Um, and of course, we knew that they were there, uh, but uh, the extent to which uh, they, they were they were there was uh, magnified by by has been magnified by the, the pandemic. So um, so in 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 my mind, I do wonder if uh, uh, and, and also hope that also other many exhibitions that 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 were closed and and uh, we 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 start to see them of course uh, with different uh, with different eyes. Um, uh, and uh, and perhaps sometimes it, it becomes uh, possible to uh, to to change the tone or to to rewrite uh, whatever text is there in the exhibition to um, um, to kind of acknowledge um, uh, what has happened in in in, in the present um, and uh, and what also has been interesting is that there were during during this lockdown and in the, in the beginning of the lockdown, there were people who died. Um, there was a, a moment, a very short moment in South Africa where the numbers of the people who died from, from the virus, from, from COVID-19, um, and the people who died from uh, police brutality, um, 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 from, from the police trying to, 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 to make people comply uh, from um, of uh, uh, COVID regulations was higher than the people dying of, uh, of COVID-19. Um, and, uh, and, and, and it was, uh, and, and uh, I also kind of noticed that someone on TV during that time uh, said that protest, in South Africa, we have 11 official languages, uh, said that protest is our 12th 
official languages. But there's, a, um, there's, there's also a stuttering that is happening uh, to our language of, of protest uh, in South Africa, especially. Um, that uh, there's something that, it, it, that makes it very difficult to articulate our unfreedom. Uh, so it was quite a moment and an interesting moment when the end SARS, uh, the hashtag end SARS in Nigeria, the protest, the, you know, the movement and protest um, became uh, so visible because sometimes it's, uh, it becomes so difficult to, um, yeah, to articulate those 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 unfreedoms, especially uh, in a context like like ours, where uh, we have a, a democratically elected government that has come after uh, um, uh, uh, apartheid as a, as a as a system of of governments and a brutal system of governments. Um, so um, yeah, so I would uh, like to yeah to end there. Um, I mean, I would say that this uh, this uh, also exhibition kind of continues and we felt the need to continue so that we can be able to uh, to with the public to 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 reflect on uh, um, on what it says of of, of 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 the present moment, how how it has occupied uh, this time uh, uh, or how it has been occupied also by this time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabi, for this presentation. And it, it, it's very interesting also, uh, as uh, Emanuele was pointing out, uh, the museum as a space for, space for imagining the future. You show us also how, how important it is to reconfigure historical positions to read the future, also the present and the future, also in a different way. Thanks so much for your presentation. And I think there will come up uh, many questions also later on. Um, I will switch to another uh, presentation of a video statement again from an artist that uh, from the artist Pedro Reyes that we have invited to pick up uh, to pick up a, a book of, from our annotated bibliography and um, and uh, tell us also how this uh, this this book or this text has influenced and inspired his practices. So. Pedro is a, an architect and artist based in Mexico City, and he explores and transforms existing problems into alternative forms of living. From turning guns into musical instruments, developing a sanatorium where alternative forms of healing can be experimented and explored, to hosting a People's United Nations to address stress, pressing concerns. In the artist's hands, complex subjects like political and economical philosophies are reframed in ways that are easy to understand, such as a puppet play featuring Karl Marx and Adam Smith's fighting over how to, sh to share cookies. This last project that, was I, that I was mentioning has been presented by Raimundas Malasauxas in our first edit editorial project in 2011. And we were very happy about his contribution. And um, we invited Pedro again to, to collaborate with us now to, to present his annotated bibliography. And uh, he has chosen to speak about uh, the, the book Limitless Contemporary Art in Mexico City, written by Edgar Hernandez and Imbal Miller, and published in 2013 by PM Publishing. This book was uh, suggested by, uh, by the curator Miguel Lopez, and we are very happy about it because it's quite it's a very interesting uh, book that is uh, that is um, speaking about the art scene in Mexico from 2000 uh, to 2010. So please let's start with the video. This is a book that was suggested by Miguel Lopez, and uh, it's a very interesting book called Sin Limites or Limitless, which uh, is a survey of art that took place in the streets mainly uh, in Mexico from 2000 to 2010. These are all hybrid situations where the, the interventions are 
almost always ephemeral, almost always outside the market. But that is something that is actually quite positive because it liberates the practice and becomes a testimony of the psyches, no, of what is happening in that moment. At the beginning of the pandemic, I thought that uh, for instance, like gatherings such as protests, etc., were kind of off the table that you know. Got. And then when I saw the mobilizations that happened in the United States, for instance, in the uh, Black Lives Matter movement, I realized that uh, that public protest will never go away, even in the in the middle of a pandemic, still happens. But. There's another uh, definitive uh, phenomena that has happened with social media. You know? uh, I believe that it has been as if there was a topological twist where the inside is in the outside and the outside is in the inside. You know? Like for instance, like we are now in a room and outside is the world, but now since we have a phone, we can be in our phone seeing everything that is outside and by broadcasting or activities, also what is inside is elsewhere. So this topological twist that has kind of a turn around the fabric of the world has also created a different kind of public space, which is, you know, like uh, the consumption of, of these uh, uh, live events, and media, etc. So this aggregates a different uh, dimension um, however, we have also seen that activities that are strictly virtual tend to lack something. No? We always uh, need a sculpture in the sense of matter and, uh, and how does that, does that matter is transformed. Also social sculpture, how human relationships interact unmediated by technology. Looking at these works, which were so clearly uh, transforming uh, real space, all these uh, uh, manifestations of performative and site-specific interventions will be, are always a kind of a vocabulary. Uh, you know, like a, a, what I find interesting about this book is that it offers for artists a very interesting palette of approaches. You know, like uh, I think that one never uh, creates artwork totally in the void, that there's kind of pre precedence to what one does. And uh, what is interesting is where you, it's not so much like where you take from work, but where you take it to. No? Uh, I think that for anyone who is kind of uh, eager to make a, an art that is alive and that is uh, a, creates memories for people, that is an experience, this book will be extremely useful. We will continue with uh, uh, another uh, with another uh, video contribution that uh, this way is uh, was sent by and prepared by Sandy Hilal. She is a Palestinian architect and researcher now based in Stockholm. She is the director of, with Alessandro Petty of Decolonizing Architecture Art Research, a non-governmental architectural studio and art residency in Beit Saur, Palestine. She's also co-founder of Campus in Camps, an experimental educational platform hosted in Daisha refugee camp in Bethlehem, Palestine. And from 2008, 2014, along her artistic pra practice, she, had the, she headed the infrastructure and camp improvement program in the West Bank at the United Nations Relief and Works Agency. And also with Sandy, we have a, a, a long a friendship and long uh, collaboration uh, in the frame of Visible. She was, uh, together with uh, the colonizing architecture, she was, um, a short, she was shortlisted 
in 2011 with the project Common Assembly, in 2015 with the project Mujavara Tree School, a collaboration among Campus in Camps and the Brazilian-based art collective Contrafile, and at least in 2019 with the project The Living Room that uh, Patrick was talking uh, uh, also about in, the, in his introduction, which is an amazing project, project she could develop in, uh, in Boden uh, with supported by the public art agency. Uh, she will, um, it will be, by, uh, be quite interesting also following up the last uh, interventions because in this video she will speak also about uh, the uh, about the public space as a, a space for building values and also a space for exercise in new values that then can be transformed then can be transfer uh, transfer uh, transferred in the in the domestic space and also that uh, these values can change our relations and our ways of living together. The book she has chosen to talk about is on decoloniality, concepts, analytics, praxis by Walter Mignolo and Catherine Walsh, which has been published in 2018 by Duke University Press and is as, as the other books part of our uh, Anoted Bibliography. of uh, Walter Mignolo and Catherine Walsh on the coloniality concept analytics and uh, praxis that it focus on the re-existence and the decoloniality as a verb. How re-existence is a practice of decoloniality in, in that sense. And, and uh, you know, at the beginning of uh, my practice, especially with uh, projects like Stateless Nation and, and Roadmap and other few projects, it was uh, all the time maybe denouncing the power system and trying to resist against it and trying to understand the matrix of control and respond all the time or, or feeding into that uh, matrix of control. And in the last period, our uh, last projects like the tree school, uh, like the living room, we are trying to understand if there are ways rather than resisting to re-exist, to imagine a different world where we can live by practicing decoloniality, where our alliances become different, where our looking at the world and where uh, our uh, knowledge production is, is taking place from a complete different uh, resources and places. Uh, you know, I met Walter Mignolo only uh, uh, two, two years ago, and we were both thinking, how come we never met before? No? And, and, and Walter was saying, my God, you are doing in architecture exactly what I was trying to do in the world. And actually, we are also initiating a group called Tents of Thoughts, where we are uh, thinking how to embrace friendship and way of thinking together as a way of practicing uh, decoloniality. I, I had experience living both in Italy and Sweden and have been part of marginalized communities and connected to marginalized communities and as a woman architect. And I guess that the public space definitely has been my uh, main challenge. Public space for me is also about building values of society and who has the right to build these values and who has less the right to build these values women and marginalized communities and 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 other uh, all sorts of people that are actually excluded by that public space would use their domestic as a means to sort of still be participating in creating parallel different kinds of values and a lot of time these two places never comes together and for me to re-exist is to bring these two, two spaces together. To, and in that sense, I think that it, the living room is a, a very important example in that sense, where I recognize that a lot of marginalized community in places like uh, Sweden has no means and, and possibilities of being active members in the public space. And they ended up by uh, exercising their life in their living room. And I think that we should never give up with the public, right? As, as our right to still be transforming society and to still be building different values and to still be demanding that we are living in a pluricultural societies and that the, the public space needs to be transforming.
sometimes I feel that we have been freezing the public space in one way of, of narration. And I think that now it's our very important task to move forward. And then, of course, the pandemic definitely will be pushing in that uh, direction because, you know, suddenly the house acquire as a space, as, as also a, a place of living, acquire a completely different meaning In order to re-exist, we have to be able to reconnect. So we are back. And now we are going towards the plenary debate among uh, all the speakers. So I ask all the speakers, Emanuele, Gabi, Rebecca, and Patrick to join us back uh, with their uh, camera as well. Uh, and uh, I mean, we're gonna try now to go around with uh, some questions that uh, Rebecca, Judith, and I have for uh, our guests. And uh, perhaps it's also interesting to start uh, from uh, the very beginning. Also, what Sandy has told us just now, no? that there is a very, a uh, frozen concept of, uh, of public art that needs to be reactivated, needs to be rethought, and all the, the thoughts that we've been sharing so far are also going towards that direction. So perhaps it's interesting to hear from the first speaker, so Patrick, to, uh, to maybe hear also how uh, public art agency uh, is uh, uh, going towards like this, uh, all this uh, making and knowing that artists are producing. So it's, they're not just practicing organizations, long-term projects, but they're also like actively uh, producing knowledge. So how does public art agency is going also to move forward uh, that is already doing, of course, but even in, a, in, a, in the future uh, in uh, uh, joining artists in this uh, making of the future, as also Emanuele was saying. So maybe to, to share a few words related to public art agency and social engaged art to make it brief. Make it very brief, yeah, because I think the public art agency under my predecessor, Magdalena Malm, really made an effort to, to break the, the sort of previous mold of public art as an object and to push for socially engaged practices in many different ways and not just permanent in permanent ways, but also the temporary temporary projects like Sandy Hilal's living room is a wonderful example of. And this is something that is yet to be evaluated, how we can take this forward. It's something we very much want to continue doing. And um, I would say that uh, at this point, uh, we are evaluating the, um, the way we can extract knowledge from these processes and infuse that knowledge in our own agency moving forward, but also in what Rebecca was talking about, the, uh, the responsibility we have to share this knowledge with communities in Sweden and also internationally, how can, how can this be done? Um, while I also think it's so important that we always acknowledge that we are a government agency. I mean, the asymmetry involved in this is a challenge. And this is a very important question for us moving forward. How do we relate to our collaborators, bringing with us this asymmetry and the knowledge of the asymmetry uh, and to create a productive relationship even, even with the asymmetry there? Maybe I can add on to that or continue that line of question because I was find it so interesting that both Gabi and you, Emanuele, took up the question of care because that's a question we have been discussing within the agency of how one can consider public art both as a kind of caregiving and a caretaking. So somehow, you know, our commission is to make art in the public space, which I one could see as a kind of caretaking or but how could you kind of think of care within those realms of the public? So that's a very open question for both Gabi and Emanuele and Patrick, if you want to come back to it. Go Gabi, go, go first. <laughs> uh, you are the specialist, so I will... Uh... <laughs> I 
think I, I need to hear the, the 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 question kind of like condensed again, if you don't mind, Rebecca. No, of course not. No, uh, how can one consider public art as both a kind of a caregiving and a caretaking? Or could you consider public art as a caretaking and caregiving? Could be another way of formulating it. Hmm, I, I have to I have to think about that a little bit, if I may. So then uh, it's my turn. So I would say that uh, it's exactly the task of public art in the sense that, uh, I mean, I'm coming now, I'm saying something which can be, can sound a little bit shocking, but I uh, I raised, I mean, uh, I was born in Italy and I spent, uh, let's say 20 years there. And what, what is interesting, uh, I mean, in the common public landscape in Italy is the fact that uh, there was of course a lot of, uh, Committance, private committance, public committance, but then there, are, there was one huge uh, uh, commit, which was the the church, who really shared, who really shaped uh, the urban uh, public space in Italy, um, in a very interesting way. Because uh, unlike other, unlike other, uh, unlike other um, uh, kind of uh, uh, public committance, they they. Uh, they used to produce uh, works, uh, uh, art, uh, works of art uh, that were accessible to every kind of public. I mean, uh, you could so you could uh, see uh, a Caravaggio, a Michelangelo, even if you were a clochard. So it was just uh, accessible to everybody, which is, uh, of course, because of this uh, kind, very strange uh, status of the of church, but which changed a lot the idea of art for Italian people, because uh, art is not something, uh, uh, how can I say, exceptional. It's not something uh, that uh, that you need to go in a museum not to see that. It's something which is already there, and it's a part of the common, quite trivial, quite uh, extremely uh, daily uh, uh, life and and uh, uh, and i would say this is exactly what the new public governance should learn uh, for, from uh, from church in the sense that it's not that i'm uh, i'm not of course uh, saying that church was a, a good institution but they had this very interesting idea that you are producing art not just uh, to uh, producing some spaces of uh, of uh, of aesthetic experience uh, but just in order to build the world we are living in and build the world everybody is living in. And this is, this is exactly what you said, Rebecca. So it's uh, at the same time, uh, a, a sort of public art that is taking care and also giving care. So it's, it's, uh, it's both also because of course, churches were the spaces of uh, taking care in a, in a in a in a in a spiritual sense. For instance, it could it could be interesting if every kind of buildings uh, which are aimed to give uh, to to take care of people, I mean, also hospitals uh, were built not just by by architects but but by by artists actually, and 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 that uh, people are just uh, asking artists to redesign space where more than two people are uh, gathering. So that, that uh, it's it's uh, more than uh, I mean it's an evidence. It we have a lot of uh, past examples and we have to uh, go again in this direction, I would say. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to answer. Thank you, <laughs> Emmanuel, for, for warming me up. Um, I mean, I, yeah, the way to answer that, I'm, I, I'm just reminded of uh, a phenomenon that was, uh, that was, became common in the in the 80s in, in South Africa, which was called peace parks. And these parks were made by people in, um, in, in, the, in, in the townships and they would emerge in, in public spaces after the death of, uh, of a person um, through uh, police brutality. Um, and, uh, and, and so these parks, they also kind of functioned as a form of, of, of protest and they, Soon enough, the apartheid government realized how, uh, I guess, dangerous for 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 the image of the states they were. So they were also 
uh, kind of uh, destroyed and, and removed. I think uh, there's uh, only one image that I know of uh, which exists where you can see um, these, uh, these uh, peace parks uh, and taken by uh, uh, David Goldberg in, in the 80s. Um, but also in, in South Africa in recent times, of course, we had the, the hashtag roads must fall um, uh, protest that started that started at the University of Cape Town uh, and, and, and then went kind of like all over the country where people started to really to question, um, of course, you questioning statues um, of uh, people with uh, 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 colonial um, connections. Um, which is everybody basically, mostly, um, who, who has a statue in, 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 in this country. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I think this was quite uh, 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 an interesting moment, a very uh, important moment in, in, recent, uh, in recent times because it brought into, into the public uh, discussion um, the, the um, yeah, the space of the public and, and why it must be occupied by, by particular histories. Um, and, uh, and one of, of the things that I, I think about a lot that also uh, um, still informs part of my thinking is, 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 is of course the removal, the ultimate removal of Cecil John Rhodes uh, statue in at the University of Cape Town and the space that is left behind on the because the podium itself is, is still there and the, and how we think through that, that that space that was like occupied by a, a huge figure of Rhodes for about 80 years and what we can imagine through 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 uh, that uh, a, a empty uh, podium. Uh, and during that time in Durban, the city where I come from, there is a, um, a statue of, uh, or a bust of uh, Pessoa, the Portuguese poet, um, that I used to see a lot of, uh, every day on my way to school. And, I, and uh, it used to fascinate me because uh, it has one of his, the line for, from his poems, uh, which reads, all oh, salty seas, how much of your salt are tears of Portugal? Um, and this particular uh, bust was, uh, was uh, somebody threw a red paint over it. And the, and the Portuguese society of South Africa said, but why he was not a politician, he was uh, an artist, um, <laughs> which was uh, uh, quite a, an interesting uh, moment. I mean, the question is that why, why, why Pessoa is mourning the, the, the uh, the tears of Portugal in in Durban, where 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 there is uh, also so much uh, history of uh, histories of, of 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 pain and of tears. I think maybe it's interesting also to go back to uh, this idea because we are talking a lot about also domestic space uh, as opposed to the public space, but actually. What the pandemic has taught us is that our domestic space has become as public as never before. I mean, my living room has been so popular in the last months as I would have never imagined it to be. If I would have known, I would have also maybe worked on it more than, than I had before. But uh, just to say that also Emanuele was talking about this traveling through time, no? like when uh, going uh, back to your uh, home and finding a home that was conceived for a nuclear family from the 19th century. So I also wonder if we can expand then the idea also that uh, now, of course, we also, when we mention the word public art, we still think of something that is very much 20th century. So very much, you know, we have uh, images of uh, public commissions for, as Emanuele was talking about, or statues in the square. But also, if I think of what Pedro Reyes was talking about before, about this idea that protest will never uh, stop. And also I think about a book that is in uh, the annotated bibliography by Rebecca Sonnet, Hope in the Dark, where she talks about also the importance of seeing uh, political movements as something that even when it doesn't look like they're actually moving uh, a collective conscience towards new understanding of our being together. So in that sense also what I find fascinating is in, in this uh, last year there was a, a completely tragic one for certain uh, things but was also uh, an year that really made us rethink completely the way we work. And so in this sense, can we add maybe new ideas, new images to what 
we conceive today as public art can. As Emanuele was saying also, uh, our use of uh, our new domesticity towards social media become a way to inform how friendships, how bonds and alliances can also become the way in which uh, the, the things that we build uh, in artistic experiences look like and, and be uh, reminded of, of the kind of uh, empathy that we have uh, been in some way asked to, to, to feel more and more in our daily life. So um, I don't know if it's a question, but also I think also look at the role of artists, for instance, uh, in one of in the book we use for every section of the of the of the of the book uh, an, an, an artwork uh, a project rather from the visible archives. So we have this work by Jonas Stahl that is about collectivizing Facebook, because uh, uh, there is a, uh, now a movement that has started with the lawyers and other and other people to say this is a space that is as public as uh, uh, you know the fire uh, fighters or uh, other institutions that were born as private, but now there is so much public interest into them that it needs to be collectivized. And we were talking about a publication that is called, uh, has been titled Collectively Annotated. So can we, can we look at, at ways of images of collectivizing that can inform our way of working uh, from now on, let's say learning from 2020? This is maybe an open question to to all of whoever feel like uh, answering this. No one. <laughs> <laughs> you, you spoke so well. So, so I would say that, no, no. Say for, for just a couple of ideas, but uh, you, you, you said all, uh, one has, has to say, so it's difficult to add something, but I would say that for instance, uh, uh, first of all, as you said, uh, actually the public space, I mean, uh, this kind of space we are uh, inhabiting now, it's either public, not private, is something which is uh, in between them. And this is perhaps the space we, the space we have, uh, sorry for the word, but to colonize, uh, because it's, uh, in a way, it's a new space produced by a technical, a couple of a technical inventions. It's a space of life, uh, but we left this space uh, to a couple of uh, very young people who use this space in order to do bullshit, actually. <laughs> so, in the, in the, so public institutions or, or the tenants of uh, old cultures are, uh, ha have, have, I mean, they have totally left uh, this space to others. And now it's time to, in a way, colonize, inhabit, uh, try to give, uh, try to make art with the, within this space, for instance. Uh, and that's important, not just because uh, you have to make art, uh, I mean, uh, digital art. That's, that's important exactly because this new space allows us to uh, go beyond the opposition of the public and the private, the state and the, and the domestic space, uh, so the, the family and the city. So in a way, it's a space of uh, infinite possible friendship. Uh, uh, and I think that also from a theoretical point of view, what we have to invent uh, is a new political form of friendship. Uh, so, you know, I'm, uh, I'm just, uh, it's not a question of art, but uh, for instance, I was uh, thinking uh, during this day the fact, about the fact that uh, actually uh, in the past, you have a lot of people, uh, you always have a lot of people who try to live together. I mean, outside from the model of family and outside from the model of uh, being alone. So for instance, I mean, uh, in the European tradition, you have a lot of uh, the monastic tradition, a lot of uh, examples. So we are the only time where people are just living either in family or alone, which is totally stupid. And we cannot, we are not able to give in a way enough space, political space to this kind of friendship, this kind of uh, other kinds of, bo of bond. And what is interesting perhaps is not to adapt art to this new kind of bonds. It's the other way around. It's the fact that through art, this kind of bonds can become uh, 
again, political. So we have uh, used art in order to make this kind of bonds uh, possible, stronger, more significant, and so on. Exactly like in a way a state or even the church needed art in order to become uh, a very powerful institution. Just to add, I find this uh, totally intriguing and I really, really like this idea. I hope we can we can work in that direction. But I was just I just wanted to add the fact that in many, at least in many Western big cities, the majority of people in some places live in single person households. So what you're saying is is an even more important, uh, I would say, to stress this in the time of of the pandemic where people who live on their own have under during a lockdown suffered more than people who live with their families, even though we, we know of increased domestic violence, so on and so forth, but people who live on their own during a severe lockdown, it's been extremely difficult. Uh, many old people obviously as well. So it has, I think, social implications that are uh, tremendously important. Yeah, in, in, uh, in an attempt to, to, to address your question, Mathilde, um, um, I have a, a collaborative uh, um, project with Tiago de Pola Souza, which is called I've Seen, I've Seen Your Face Before. And it's, it's really about re-encounters uh, uh, and rethinking also curatorial research. Uh, but it's a it's a it's a project that was about travel, you know, going um, to see people that we've met before, and to stay in a place um, for you know for longer than three days, for for two weeks uh, uh, sometimes. Um, and with the pandemic, of course, we have to rethink and this uh, uh, this project and uh, and and even I mean perhaps the title I mean the title remains. Uh, of course, but we had to kind of rethink it, and and I think in in in, in these kind of collaborative spaces, we've had uh, perhaps the most difficult uh, uh, conversations with um, with different people, but also the most rewarding um, at the same time. Um, and uh, and 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 there's like a lot of people keeping in touch with 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 with, with, with one another. Uh, in ways that uh, often we don't do also when we travel, when we meet, we, uh, we have our meeting and then we go for dinner, we go to a bar. Um, but with these uh, uh, interactions, although we are further apart, we feel also quite very close um, uh, together to, 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 to some instances. Um, so yeah, the, the rethinking of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of these, re-encounters has been a, um, yeah quite a quite a journey uh, uh, in itself and I, and I think yeah it, it has been it has it is yeah it has changed of course the way that we think uh, about research uh, and how we go to places uh, even if we don't uh, arrive by basically. Mm -hmm. I would like also to add uh, in a certain way that, that this kind of uh, relations and uh, political friendships you were mentioning also, Emanuele, uh, this coming together, um, uh, this, we, we observe it very much in the project that we are researching on and uh, promoting and sustaining. And what we have seen also this idea, we are very much playing with this idea of, uh, it's very attractive idea of uh, city, city curators and the museums that have the role with artists to shape the cities in the future. But what we think also, what is a, a very important question is related to time and temporality, because this kind of practices that are based maybe uh, on a more on a relational process, they, come, they, they ask completely a different time frame and maybe also a different way to be supported, to be contextualized and uh, which in, in, in the institutions, I don't know now, we have a state agency here in the in the in the platform in the group but uh, in, in in other countries where you have museums that have this role organizations the big problem problem is also that we need to shift also this idea how to um, to produce how to support this kind of practices because they are completely working in a different rhythm 
then the creation maybe of, a, of an artwork that you exhibit or that you maybe create for a biennale or you, you know, this is more an event-based situation and, and, it's me, and, and this time question for me is one question which is very, very important related to this kind of projects where these relations can, uh, can, can grow and can change also then our way of living. But I think for us, that's a very crucial question because also we have one factor we have to deal with is that we get budget for one year at a time, which means we very often have to end the project after one year, which really kind of does not at all fit into how we want to work with these kind of practices. And again, coming back to kind of the example of Sandy Hilal's Almada for the living room, we're now you know, trying to find new ways of sustaining that kind of work. And I think for us, that's really a question for the future. How can we work with these kind of projects that are relational, that are based on a kind of long-term commitment and find a sustainable solution for them? It's super tricky, even for us as a start agency, but I think this is really maybe one of the most urgent questions for us. What I find also, uh, just to pick up also some of the many, many uh, brilliant uh, traits of, uh, of the conversations that, uh, and the contributions that were uh, happening tonight. But uh, for instance, Elizabeth Povinelli spoke about the, the separation of uh, geology and biology, you know? uh, which, I th which also made me think a lot of the work of Emanuele when he also speaks about uh, an idea of, uh, uh, of, let's say, interspecies also uh, scenarios where, for instance, also uh, the museum or the art institution or the cultural production cannot anymore be something that happens be only between humans, but can also needs to uh, include, you know, other other species and other perspectives, other other perceptions of of, of the world and learn. Uh, from this, which is also something, as you did uh, rightly pointed out, is something we observe uh, in projects by artists. For instance, if you look at uh, uh, cooking sections uh, with the climate work project, how much they are rethinking the way we eat through climate, but also through the uh, scientific knowledge of so many people that are studying uh, seaweed uh, or uh, like other uh, plants and how they uh, relate to the resources and how they use the resources in order to exist and then learn from it in order to rethink the way in which uh, a restaurant can work in a highly saturated uh, uh, area of tourism uh, where salmon uh, farming is the only uh, perspective they have and of course it's a perspective that can no, can no longer exist. So uh, in this sense also so, uh, thinking about the role of art in this is also interesting to observe how much uh, uh, there are efforts in coming from them in different perspectives and Cara Bing is another one to really think how to imagine uh, uh, perhaps uh, a new terminology, a new glossary, but it also includes uh, knowledge that comes from non-human, uh, uh, let's say, contributions. So I don't know if, uh, Emanuele, I know you've been many times also part of conversation uh, uh, in, uh, about rethinking what could be a post-pandemic scenario. So, and, and also Gabi, I know also how you are rethinking also the model of, of curating in that sense, but also if there are also ideas that you want to bring to the table in this sense, in, in terms of also uh, thinking in an interspecies uh, way. Uh, perhaps I will start uh, uh, <laughs> just a couple of days. First of all, uh, we have to acknowledge that uh, um, there are uh, already um, scientific studies or uh, biologists, ornithologists, uh, but it was already an intuition uh, by Darwin uh, that, uh, I mean, people are now uh, uh, proved uh, that there is art among non-human species in the sense that actually, a lot of what we call uh, natural evolution uh, is based on uh, uh, taste judgment. And it's in a way uh, um, an evolution of the forms of the living, which is comparable to the evolution of artifacts uh, made by human beings. So in a way, we really start to study uh, 
nature with the eyes of uh, an histor or an art historian. So it's in a way we should really start to look at uh, I don't know peacocks or or or, uh, or plants uh, with uh, a curatorial uh, 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 look in the sense that we should uh, read the natural environment as a sort of non-human biennial made by other species for other species. So it would. <laughs> too long to develop this idea, but it's uh, in a mean based on uh, current research. Uh, on the other side, uh, uh, I would say that, uh, and that's the second idea, I would say that uh, actually we really uh, try to use museum exactly in the same sense we have to use art in order to impose uh, friendship uh, uh, in the political space. We really have to, in a way to uh, um, tear uh, the ecological questions to ecologists and give them uh, to artists. Uh, and we really have to use museums in order to rethink multi-species uh, uh, cohabitation in the sense that uh, actually one of the main problem we have uh, uh, when we are facing ecological problems is the fact that ecology itself, uh, despite the attempts of ecofeminism uh, is still a very uh, reactionary and patriarchal uh, uh, science. I mean, uh, when we are speaking about uh, 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 ecology, we are always thinking about preservation, conservation. We are never thinking about how can a couple of uh, different species reinvent, they are uh, rearrange, renegotiate their own uh, cohabitation. And that's why we have to put this kind of questions within museums. Museums should be kind of uh, uh, places for experimenting uh, a new form of nature or sort of, uh, we should transform museums into museums for contemporary nature, not just art. So where, where different species are just meeting and try to reinvent their own uh, 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 covenant uh, in order to re, uh, rethink their places. Uh, so, and it's not so difficult. For instance, uh, I, just in order to be a little bit uh, more uh, um, uh, sensitive, more uh, clear, for instance, uh, a couple, no, 10 years ago, uh, uh, two Italian uh, um, architects and uh, designers, Andrea Branzi and Stefano Bueri, presented for um, the project of Grand Paris. So Paris is expanding itself, it's now uh, uh, trying to um, uh, enact uh, the, the, the towns uh, uh, which, uh, which lie on the frontier of the city. And they presented this project for the Grand Paris, uh, just the uh, uh, idea of freeing within the city Five, uh, 50,000 cows and 30,000 apes uh, within the city. <laughs> and the idea was actually when you are doing that, uh, it's not just in order to reinvent uh, cohabitation among different species. The idea that is that once that you have cows and apes uh, within a city, you have to move differently. You have to pay attention to everything because uh, uh, because uh, every every time, each, each in each moment, at each moment, can come someone uh, uh, that you cannot, uh, in a way, uh, 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 foresee. And that's interesting also from a theoretical point of view because this kind of project says that uh, we do not have to think that the city is the space for human beings and then the forest is the space for cows or uh, apes. No, the space belongs to no one and apes, uh, uh, the city becomes the space where apes, uh, cows, human beings, uh, uh, rats, they have to renegotiate each day this uh, they own a space of inhabitation. And that's an interesting idea, for instance. So museums should uh, in a way, convey this kind of uh, idea for, for uh, the future cities. Um, I think uh, it's it's the first time that I've lived uh, so long with my plants. I have a lot of plants um, that have survived for a very long time, and uh, I managed to kill uh, almost half of them by by being present. <laughs> by, I guess, by over, yeah, over feeding them. Um, yeah, so I, 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 
uh, it, I think uh, I've I realized that I, I, I am not good at taking care of, uh, of that species myself. <laughs> it was too much care. It was over caring. We have a, an art project that we have commissioned at the Public Art Agency, which is called The Forest Calling by two artists called Åsa Elsén and Marlena Nell, which I think speaks to this a bit. They're and departing from uh, this uh, Fogelsta, the Fogelsta movement, which is an early feminist movement in Sweden. And they had a big farm where they had like courses for, for women and, and a school. And they also had a forest and they have a lot of theories, beautiful, this is a hundred years ago, text about how one tree needs the other tree because the roots are connected. So what Malin and Osa had, have been trying to do with this project is to rethink the monument and make a part of this forest a monument. So they have made a contract so it won't be, uh, what do you call them? Uh, you know, it's this kind of forest that you use. So they tear, like, take it down and then they regrow it. But now the artists have managed to make this contract that no one will touch it for 75 years. And then in 75 years, it will become a cultural heritage because then it's what you in Swedish called urskog, like an old forest that you cannot touch. So I think in that sense, they're also using art in this beautiful way of, you know, not touching the forest and by not touching it, it becomes a work of art. Yeah, which I just thought of when you were talking about Emanuele. Which I find interesting because in some way it's also going from a legacy of uh, extreme empathy with nature from the feminist collective and now to this quite uh, I mean, you can also call it conservative because that's also what, what the end result is, but by claiming this as, a, as an artwork rather than, a, uh, than as a state, uh, let's say, rule or governmental choice. So in that sense, uh, um, yeah, maybe it's, uh, it's also important to say about also what also we meant with this annotated biography to do it in such a collective way it was also a way to really like show to to use this beautiful image of the trees uh, that they need each other because the roots are connected was really also in our way to show how much uh, we need each other we need each other researches insights and knowledge to really be able to think about anything that we can call future in a sense that you know the the bibliography is also done in such a way that we for with all the suggestions we tried also to create this uh, um, let's say, mm, thematic uh, um, concepts that are never understood as labels. It's not, it's not, it's, there's no idea of encyclopedical uh, classification of the books that we received, but rather to really suggest uh, already in a dynamic form, uh, the way these uh, main topics are presented, that is always like in a narrative way and never in a, in a affirmative and statement way, but also to show how uh, this knowledge really uh, is, a, is a knowledge production that really is hyper-connected. Uh, and across the world, there are, ref there are books that are read uh, in one place or another, or like books that are completely uh, reshaping the way certain topic was uh, understood. Uh, and, and also this for us is extremely important to really um, show how any kind of socially engaged art is rooted and is fed by this idea of a collective knowledge that is constantly producing, but at the same time is also constantly fed by a dialogue between practitioners, artists, and also uh, Emanuele in his interview uh, spoke very also sp speak a lot about the museum, also speaks about this idea where there is no, no separation between making and knowing. And you, you talk about also the museum as a sort of school uh, where for people who never stops building the world and a world that, that is an unknown world from, from before. So this idea, I think also for us was really pivotal to show how uh, thinkers, artists, curators, and, and also going in the direction of what we were trying to talk about before, this completely uh, intersection of disciplines, of knowledges that are is the only way really to uh, look at art as a, a space of potential, uh, uh, let's say, future that we are all uh, 
looking towards, no? let's say. So in this sense, I think also your words really makes complete sense in, in uh, claiming also what this book uh, has been in the last two years in the making, but also what we are trying to, to offer no? as, a, as planting uh, seeds for, for a yeah, common good, let's say, in the, in, the, in the public space of art. In that sense, we should also maybe mention very clearly that the book is available online as a PDF on the Public Art Agency website. The digital platform is online on the Visible's uh, homepage, with also with a link from us. So this is also part of it, that this material is from now on made public and accessible, and that's very important for us, um, that it can be downloaded for free. And, Mm -hmm. accessible but then of course it will be a printed book as well and uh, i would like to add also that it's not a, a finished research but it's an ongoing research and uh, as said we would like really to to continue to invite people to suggest books and uh, this is something it's a challenge that will be we will be we will continue and uh, therefore we would like really to thank public art agency that uh, gave us this uh, starting uh, the start uh, the possibility to start this research because it's quite important also that someone uh, gives you the trust to start a project. Thanks yeah. so much. And for us, it's the same, but the other way around. <laughs> thank you. Continue building this this library, but we also want to thank you so much for, as I said, taking on this task and kind of making it into what it is because we came with the kind of. And of, of course, we come always with a lot of people, not alone. <laughs> this is very non-nuclear family of visible, indeed. Yes. <laughs> and with this, I think we're going towards the, the, the end of, uh, of, the, of this beautiful online launch that, uh, yeah, originally was supposed to happen in Stockholm. Uh, we would have uh, uh, had uh, Gabi and Emmanuel in Stockholm, but I mean, this is certainly more sustainable <laughs> than, than what we would have planned. And also we want to thank Carolina Leo, that is uh, the person that managed to make all of what you watched happen. So that is the curator for uh, online programs uh, at Visible and also Beatrice Galluzzo, that was our assistant, uh, editorial assistant throughout the, the, two, the last year of research. Uh, we want to thank uh, again, of course, uh, Public Art Agents with Patrick and warmly Rebecca that uh, uh, supported us for the last two years, but also Annika and Magdalena that also were uh, in the background and Magdalena also started all of this. Uh, and we want to thank, of course, the 10, uh, uh, the ten curators that, uh, man, that, that really made uh, with their contribution this book happen. Of course, the three respondents, uh, Emanuele, Gabi and Andrea, and Emanuele and Gabi even more, more warmly for being here tonight. Uh, and uh, if I haven't forgotten anyone, you did. Yes, maybe we should uh, thanks also the three artists we invited, Pedro, Sandy, and Elizabeth, that they were responding to our request to give their insight. And I would like to thank also Studio Lupo Butcher, Angelica Butcher, Daniele Lupo, and Giulia Semprini, that were develop developing the graphic design of the book. And it was uh, an amazing uh, dialogue and uh, research also really to, 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 to make it interesting also that we have this connection with the annotated bibliography um, on the online section and also that it, it, uh, this kind of books becomes very accessible for other researchers from other fields and the topics we were thinking was an entry point to make these uh, books more accessible and these discourses more accessible for people that are not from the, the field of, uh, of art. So thanks a lot for this collaboration also. So I think it's uh, it's uh, the end. So thank you, grazie. Thank you. Thank you.